Um, good evening and welcome to everybody this evening uh, to the Audit and Risk Management Committee, Monday the 16th of November 2020. Um, as you all know, my name is Catherine Hodson and I am chairing the Audit and Risk Committee for the first time this evening. So before I get into any other introduction, if I could ask you, if I do forget to see names, hands up or um, don't see you in the chat box, please interrupt me and remind me. I'd like to remind all members and attendees to turn off their cameras and microphones until asked to speak. Uh, the um, monitoring officer, Phil Court, will undertake a roll call of the members present. And if I could just explain the webcast notice for people watching, this meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the council website. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a recourses tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and debate. Um, so, Phil, do you want to do the roll call now? Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, if you'd uh, care to turn on your camera and then announce your presence, please. Uh, Councillor Bird. Good evening. Councillor Burgess Joyce. Uh, good evening. Councillor Cannon. Good evening, everybody. Councillor Cox. No. Councillor Greeny. Good evening. Councillor Hodson, obviously. Yep. Good evening. Yeah. Councillor Jones. Uh, good evening. Sorry, it was new beauties. Councillor Kelly. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Lewis. Councillor Ian Lewis present. And Councillor Whittingham. Evening, present. And anybody I've missed? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I haven't received any apologies for absence, um, but I noticed Councillor Cox isn't here yet. He may not be able to attend so we'll we'll carry I'm on already here oh yeah how are you I did say hello hello oh hi yeah. sorry tony i didn't hear you nice to see you love um right any decla members declarations of interest no no Stuart. Uh, yep yeah th th thanks chair just uh, a person interested in agenda item six as two schools which i'm governor are mentioned in as they've been has been audited yeah uh, just gilbrook and Krugoff. OK, that's lovely. Thank you for that, Stuart. Um, then we go on to the minutes to approve the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of March 2020 and the special meeting held on the 21st of September 2020. Did everybody agree the meetings of those two meetings? <coughs> agreed. Yes, agreed. Thank you for that. Um, I, agenda item four is public questions. There aren't any public questions that I'm aware of. Um, uh, um, there are no statements and petitions under declaration uh, public questions 4B, 4C questions by uh, members. I don't have any. Uh, I do know that Stuart Whittingham, sorry, Stuart um, Kelly wants to ask que questions under agenda item 5. So we'll do that at, at the time. Um, so now we'll go on to agenda item five, internal update, and I'll invite Mark Niblock, the chief internal auditor, to present the report and then invite members to ask questions and comments afterwards. And over to you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a regular report that I present to members of this committee. Um, it, the uh, report actually contains information relating to the delivery of the internal audit service. Uh, this particular report acknowledges the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on service delivery and concentrates um, <clears throat> excuse me, on four quite distinct areas. The impact of COVID-19 on the internal audit plan of work for the current year, the internal audit activity uh, undertaken for the year to date, planned internal audit work for the remainder of the year and to your attention. So if I start at section 3.4 on page 16 of your uh, papers, where I identify uh, the significant impact that the pandemic has clearly had on the uh, the internal audit plan, 
for the year to date. Um, I would draw members' attention to the COVID-19 work that's been undertaken by the team uh, and the corresponding changes that have been made to the plan to accommodate this work. A copy of the revised audit plan is attached to this report at Appendix 1 and includes uh, annotations against each entry in the plan to explain the uh, change emphasis of the, uh, the work that we'll be targeting for the remainder of the year. At section 3.5 on page 17 of the uh, committee papers, I identify some of the work that Intel Audit have undertaken during the year to date, including both COVID-19 related work and more latterly scheduled audit work in some key risk areas such as procurement and the Merseyside Pension Fund. Section 3.6 on page 19 of the committee papers identifies some of the work planned by the team for the remainder of the year as identified in the revised Intel Audit plan as attached capturing and targeting work in some of those areas where we feel that increased risks have arisen out of the pandemic, such as cyber security uh, and some of the fraud and corruption work. Section 3.7 on page 19 of the report identifies some of the items of note involving targeted work currently being undertaken. This includes the uh, counter-fraud campaign that kicked off today, and I've written to you all independently about to, to, to promote and, and raise awareness at every given opportunity. And a piece of work that we're currently uh, bringing to a conclusion on the uh, COVID-19 decisions taken. Uh, we took a sample of decisions that were taken during the height of the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Uh, and I've undertaken a sort of cradle to grave uh, test review of those decisions to make sure that they were undertaken in the correct fashion and that relevant documentation and supporting evidence what, what was in place. As I say, that, that work is coming to a conclusion and, and the outcome of which will be reported to this committee in due course. Members are actually asked to note the report and to endorse the, the revisions that we've made to the plan. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that, that, that members may have at this point. Does anybody have any questions for Mark on agenda item five? Right, are there any, oh yes, uh, Stuart Whittingham, if you'd like to speak, Stuart. Thanks, Chair. Um, apologies, Mark, thanks for the report. Apologies, I can't, I can't point directly to it, but um, I read in the report, it might be in the next agenda, I some you know, whereby actually complete, complete a, a body of work sufficient enough for you to provide an opinion for next year. Uh, might be a challenge. I'm just wondering what the consequences of that would be. Um, <laughs> not something I want to give an awful lot of thought to at this moment in time. Uh, as I, I do identify in this report that um, that the, the challenges will be significant to try and get enough work undertaken in targeted areas between now and the year end uh, to support an annual opinion will be difficult. I am talking to colleagues, I'm talking to professional bodies at the moment, I'm attending a session with um, the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors and SIPA members uh, next week, along with colleagues from up and down the country to, to discuss this very issue, how we can support an opinion, uh, given that we've lost at least kind of 50% of our kind of normal business as, as usual. So uh, it, it is difficult. We don't know exactly what the consequences are likely to be at this moment in time. Um, we will be discussing as of this with, with the professional bodies, with our external auditors. I'm hopeful that, that, that some level of compromise will be reached. Like on a, um, These are unprecedented times. It, I say it's difficult to know with, with any great certainty, I'm afraid, at the moment. But as soon as I'm, I'm alert to, I'll, I'll make sure that you're all made aware of uh, what we're likely to be able to achieve and, and what the uh, potential consequences will be. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Does anybody else? Uh, uh, Councillor Tony Cox. Tony, if you'd like to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think this is one for uh, probably Mark in collaboration with Chair, I would uh, think. Um, it's on regeneration in place. So I'm sure we'll have all been uh, seeing in the news the uh, disaster that is Croydon Council. Um, and the massive indebtedness that they found themselves in due to property investments. Now, I, I would suggest that our, um, uh, our dipping our toe in the water into property investments is slightly different with the uh, Whittle Growth Company. However, undoubtedly, um, commercial property has just lost value quite massively. Uh, there's other members on here who may be able to comment on this as well. Um, 
not just because of uh, uh, COVID, other other uh, financial reasons are there as well, but COVID in particular. So, uh, is is there any um, extra focus going to be uh, placed upon Little Growth Company and our expectations uh, and basically exposure to risk if we don't achieve what we're expecting to achieve through the Little Growth Company with the uh, property investments? Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, to you, Chair, for, from my perspective uh, and in direct response to that question, yes, there is uh, increased emphasis on uh, the work of the, the growth company. Um, we have three pieces of work scheduled for the remainder of, of uh, this particular year like, uh, um, with more to follow. Um, the first piece of work has actually just been started and looks at the, the governance arrangements, governance and, and financial reporting arrangements that are in place. To, to make sure that, that we're comfortable with the governance arrangement, but equally are, are, are informed in, in the correct fashion in relation to the financial aspects and elements uh, associated with, with the work that's to be undertaken. Um, we would always plan to undertake work of this nature, but as I mentioned earlier, we've had to make some revisions to the, the audit plan of work. This is one of those areas that we feel presents uh, significant enough risks to, to warrant sort of inclusion going forward and increased uh, emphasis. So uh, I don't know whether Cher would like to, to add anything to that. Uh, yes, Cher, you, I can see your hands up. You want to come in, Cher? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just just through you to answer that. Um, yeah, so um, Councillor Cox, we have had some um some external uh, work done on on specifically on Birkenhead commercial district in terms of the work that uh, will growth company is doing so um, at the start of the pandemic we asked um, our financial advisors to do a bit of a risk assessment a risk analysis of whether there was still um, a market for us if you like for to go ahead with um, Birkenhead commercial district uh, and to do a bit of a risk assessment on that and see what the impact is and the information that we've had back from them is that it's still um, valid it's still uh, feasible and we, we still have the market and there, is, there still is interest in going forward with that um, and I do have a, a speak to the director of regen and place quite often in terms of our position on this and the information and intel that he's had is that um, the work that we're doing with rural growth company is still um, is still feasible and it is still needed and we still need to do to go ahead with it notwithstanding the information that Mark said obviously any uh, outcome and output from Mark's reports will um, will feed into that but it is something we're keeping our, our eye on on an ongoing basis and um, constantly reviewing the position. Thanks both, thanks Stuart. Um, Stuart I think uh, you want to come in don't you and ask a question. Stuart Kelly. Yeah um, okay um, yeah um, what it is, I, I, I just wanted to, um, members will be aware of, of issues that have arisen at uh, Woodchurch Road Primary School um, uh, recently. And I, I'd just like to ask for uh, a report um, on on those issues um, at the school and in particular the financial monitoring support that's given to schools, uh, mostly via service level agreement arrangements uh, with the council. Um, I am aware there's been a breakdown in control over a period of years, uh, which I think has led to governors not being made aware of a build-up of debt at their school. Um, and this has now become apparent and it seems that the breakdown um, is with the financial monitoring service provided to schools rather than with schools uh, themselves. Um, Chair, I think the governor's staff and parents of Woodchurch Road Primary in particular, and of course of other community schools around the borough, need to understand what's gone wrong uh, with the financial controls here uh, and the reporting mechanisms and receive assurances uh, that the same problems are not going to reoccur uh, or have occurred um, and affect other schools' uh, budgets. And I hope, Chair, we can agree to receive uh, such a report uh, as at our next meeting. Uh, yes. Are you all right with that, Mark? I know you've had email exchanges and I've read them read them all. Um, for, for clarification for the rest of the committee, um, could you explain um, the comments that Stuart has brought up with regard to financial monitoring and and were um, I won't use the word blame but I'm going to because that makes it people understand that word um, were 
the initial financial controls should have been? Should it have been in the school, the school governors initially, um, that should yes. have seen sorry, sorry, should have seen the overspend, um, and when they've received um, the year end accounts, that that would have flagged up some irregularities. Through you, Chair, uh, a, a combination of issues, certainly. Uh, the school were certainly highly culpable in terms of the, the effectiveness of their governor's arrangements and reporting arrangements to, to the, 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 the governors. The governors themselves and the head teacher equally uh, played a significant part in that they weren't challenging enough. They didn't have the correct governance procedures in place to to, to be monitoring and evaluating the information that, that, that they were getting. They didn't challenge sufficiently and ask for, for, for more information when it clearly was becoming apparent that, that there were issues starting to develop there. Um, they were buying in services from the council in relation to the uh, LMS bursa services um, that, that weren't sufficient for, for the needs uh, of that particular school. Um, there are different grades of, of kind of service that, that a school purchases from, from the council. They were purchasing a very sort of bog standard, kind of very limited service, like know, which has certainly contributed uh, over a number of times to, to, to the financial issues that, that materialised there. Um, a lot of these uh, controls came to light when we were asked to undertake a targeted audit at that school. That targeted audit, like on air, did produce a significant number of actions and recommendations um, that, that, that led to uh, a, a, a lot of activity at the school subsequently. Uh, equally, um, there have been changes made from the council's perspective in relation to the LMS bursa service that's provided. And where a school's not purchasing kind of the, the high-end kind of service, like how we kind of plug that gap um, and, and, and what measures we take to ensure that more robust financial monitoring is undertaken. A lot of those actions have now been implemented and things have been tightened up. There is unlikely to be a situation materialises of a similar type kind of nature to this. However, there were issues clearly in evidence at the time, like on a, um, across a range of kind of uh, activities. So what Stuart is asking for is, is a, a report that captures all of that, I, I would imagine. I've certainly responded to, to, to Councillor Kelly in relation to, to some of those issues directly kind of thing, but yeah. I can understand why you would want a sort of more comprehensive report for the benefits of the committee that, that captures all of that. Yeah. Um, I, but I don't think there's a problem in, in relation to me liaising with because this, this covers a, 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 a lot of other areas like on and there would certainly need to be input to this report from the head of LMS and from from children as, as well as from from an audit perspective like you know, we have a rolling program of audits that that, that uh, on a four-year cycle so you know we, we spend three days every four years in, in, in a similar way to to our, our state colleagues and external audits and the like so uh, we're probably not best place to be identifying these things on a, on a, on a more regular sort of timely basis because of the nature of the way in which we kind of we can only resource these these schools in that way so but certainly i can contribute to that through the work that we've undertaken the, the, the problems that we identified and subsequent actions that have been taken so to to, to cut a long story short so yeah yes we can be bringing a report back i would say Stuart, did you want to come back at all no, that, that, that's entirely acceptable. I understand that you know work has already gone on behind the scenes. It's I think it's the assurance for governors, parents, teachers, schools. Um, uh, I mean, Miss Nibrock talks about you know bog standard services and premier services. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, you cut it. Schools will have had an expectation of what, if you like, the bog standard service covers, um, but that might not have been what it what it was intended to cover and I think schools need to be uh, need to be aware um, if if something is described as bog standard exactly what what they're getting for the yeah. money because whether it's bog standard or premier they're paying for it yeah. um, and I think there's possibly an argument to be had there I won't go into it now but um, my understanding or the argument is being put to me by others is is that the the errors that were apparent all really to have been picked up 
by bog standard um, audits. Now, that might be something that uh, that needs to be considered uh, yeah. uh, by by, uh, by officers in, a, in an open and frank way. If something's gone wrong, you know, it's not just about blame. It's about understanding what's gone wrong um, and accepting culpability where culpability lies. Um, so hopefully we can uh, we can get to the bottom. Well, that's, in my view, one of the jobs of the audit and risk uh, committee to make sure that we get this sort of oversight and are able to probe errors when they when they become apparent. There's certainly been errors, and it's impacting quite strongly on one of our community schools. Thanks. Um, I know Stuart Whittingham's got his hand up, and I think Adrian wants to speak at all uh, as well. So, but if I could just come back there, Mark, and say because in the audit and risk um, briefing notes, the next um, audit of schools is going to be twelve as opposed to twenty-four in the next year. And, and I suppose, following on from what Stuart said, we do need to make sure that um, schools initially understand what they're paying for and what they're going to get for that money, um, and that the fact that it's only for every four years that we audit, so they need to have robust systems in place themselves, uh, and not leave it for four years for audit and you know for the in our uh, auditors to pick up. Um, and do you do you think do you think doing twelve out of twenty four that you can identify the most, uh, or is it possible to identify the twelve out of those twenty four schools that you think may be the ones that need to be targeted? Um, yeah, to, through you, Chair. Um, what I would say is that uh, that the twelve that we're conducting is is this year's. We would like we we would clearly have done more, but as a direct result of the sort of pandemic, we've had to sort of cull a lot of what's in the audit plan for this year. So the number of schools like on it has been reduced significantly. Yeah. Uh, what we will do certainly, and what we have already done, I should say, like on it, is identify those schools where we feel there are more significant risks being presented. And those risks are, are identified as a result of previous audits of, of known issues involving kind of, you know, either financial or governance procedures in operation at schools. So we, we've got a reasonably decent handle on, I think, where the risks are, are more prevalent at some of those schools. Like and So uh, it, it's certainly um, it's certainly something that we will be doing like, and can do. Uh, Ideally, we'd like to do more. Certainly, what I would say is that that the the four yearly cycle, like on effort for a, for an audit, like on air, is pretty consistent. Uh, in fact, it's probably more than, than than a lot of our sort of counterparts are doing uh, uh, up and down the country. That there isn't an awful lot of internal audit resource focused on on schools audits these days. I must admit, a lot of emphasis is placed on on the the schools themselves being advised through the financial services handbooks about what they should and shouldn't be doing and what yeah. controls and processes they should have in place, with some support from the local authority through the uh, LMS versus unit, like uh, which yes. as a direct result of of kind of woodshed I alluded to a little bit earlier, yeah. some of those processes have certainly been tightened up as a direct result of, of the issues in relation to what a school purchases and what it doesn't purchase in relation of, to that support, that can be fleshed out a little bit in, in this report to, to give you a little bit more in, in the way of kind of context and assurance, I would say, going forward. OK, that's lovely. Um, Stuart, if you want to speak next. Stuart Whittingham. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. I was, I was going to uh, make a normal comment, but, um, but if you don't mind, I'll... While the subject of Woodchurch Road Primary has been discussed, um, I'd like to welcome a report. I would very much welcome the report. No, no, so as a committee, we, we can get a handle what's what's gone on and, and obviously uh, get some assurance that no control measures are put in place to, to prevent a recurrence. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, the staff seems to be taking the, te no paying the price for this, uh, particularly the low, low, paid, low paid staff, uh, which is a whole different issue. Um, I think at the end of the day, in terms of schools, you know, the book stop, stops with the governors. I mean, if, the, if governors aren't asking the right questions, then you, you need, you, I think the question needs to be asked about the skill sets um, mm -hmm. of the governors and obviously you no know, um, no, no, no senior staff within schools need to be open and ad ad advise governors you know, accordingly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I very much welcome a, a, re a report that comes to a future committee uh, you know, going to you know, look greater detail. Um, Back to my original question, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, we've seen um, we've seen the disaster in Northamptonshire, you know, where, where the, sec the first council in over 20 years to issue a Section 114 notice. Um, I think COVID has put extra pressure uh, on council finances and also, obviously, 
Um, no, we we were no due to no years of austerity. No, we we having our funding funding's been um, ripped out of us on a continuous basis for ten years. Um, no, my my ten years as a councillor, you know, we've always been administering cuts. Um, I'm just wondering what what work has been done in terms of uh, sustainability of our finances, uh, because obviously okay. don't want don't want to see uh, you know the, the the case nowhere by we're having to even start stripping away at uh, statutory services. <coughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously there are two councils now, aren't there? Because there's Croydon Council as well that's gone into as issued a section one one four. So, I, I, I suspect, Mark, do you want to answer that one, or do you want to bring Cher in? Who do you think? I, we I, both I, of you? I can I can chip in, but I suspect yeah. it might be better yeah. uh, if Cher is able to uh, yeah. come in and. Is that okay with you, Cher? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So. Um, yeah, there has been two reports to the Policy and Resources Committee uh, regarding the Council's finances, one uh, on the 7th of October and one uh, just last week on the 11th of November. Um, uh, the Council is uh, experiencing significant difficulties as a result of um, the pandemic. It has impacted on our ability to, on our ability to make the savings that we were due to make um, this year. Uh, and also we are experiencing some issues in terms of income uh, generation um, with our facilities being closed. The there is a government compensation scheme. So the government has um, allowed us some funding to reclaim some money uh, that we've lost as a result of lost income from sales fees and charges. But it's not it's not 100 percent of the, the income. So we are um, experiencing some difficulty, difficulty in terms of that. There's also uh, additional demand that's coming through in terms of uh, the impact of the pandemic on uh, children's safeguard in social care and also uh, SEN transport and homelessness as well. So we have some difficulties this year. I think uh, the last report that went to policy and resources last week was identified um, around about, I think, a £20 million gap for quarter two just in this year and an additional sort of 30 to 40 million pound gap I think uh, off the top of my head I'm not 100% certain of those figures um, but it will be in the report if members want to have a look uh, for next year so uh, at this point in time um, because of the, the timing it has been kind of exacerbated by the fact that we have moved into a committee system um, and we've not been able to take decisions and involve members as, as early on as we'd have liked to. Um, we've not been able to do that with the first opportunity we had to do that was on the 7th of October. Um, so as a result of that, the council has applied for a capitalisation directive um, to MHCLG that they will apply to HM Treasury on our behalf, which effectively um, means that we would borrow money from the Public Work Loans Board, the PWLB, um, and that would, uh, if you like, write off our deficit for this year and next year. Obviously, the impact of borrowing the money is that we would need to repay it back over future years. But the impact is that we would be able to have a bit of um, time to enable us to produce a, a five year recovery plan that would mean um, that we would be able to implement some different options, look at the way the council works uh, and really um, produce a robust plan over five years to make sure that we're back on a, a financially sustainable footing. Um, and we are doing that at the moment. We are uh, currently in con consultation with MHCLG and I actually um, ha emailed them this afternoon regarding the, the plan and when that might actually uh, come to them. We don't know yet as to what the date would be, as to whether they would uh, agree the capitalisation directive or not. So it, it is a bit um, difficult for us to plan, but uh, that has been the subject of my uh, communication with them this afternoon, is that if they could give us a timescale as to when we would find out. Obviously, that would really help us in terms of knowing what we do and we, to go forward. Mm -hmm. um, can't see any hands up at the moment. If I could just ask, Cher, how much money have we received to date from the government for, for COVID funding? Uh, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. It's definitely over 100 million. So we could be looking about around about 140 million. Um, not all of that we've received to spend um, directly on COVID ourselves. So over uh, around about 70 million, probably more than that, actually, um, we've received on behalf of um, businesses. So we've actually received money to, for grants that we would passport to um, businesses, to local businesses, and also to people who are self-isolating. We've got self-isolation payments as well. But it's, de it's definitely, you know, knocking the £150 million pound mark from government. And, and how much of the money that is specifically for the uh, for Willowborough Council to offset 
COVID costs in terms of um, loss of revenue. Um, if you if you if you took out uh, COVID and the cost of COVID in terms of the loss of revenue, uh, because through car parks and business rates and all that sort of thing, um, how much of the deficit would there still be? If you strip out COVID, would, there would still be a deficit no matter what. If we stripped out COVID completely, um, we were actually forecasting that we would. Um, so we, we put some options proposals to full council in March this year. Um, and we were forecasting that we would be able to balance the budget this year and in, and in future years as well. So we did have a medium term financial plan that would, um, depending on the on the additional demand coming forward in future years, um, we were almost on a financially sustainable footing. Um, so in theory, we were planning not to have a deficit if there wasn't, if COVID never existed. OK, so um, how much will the government uh, extra, how much extra will they give us um, if, if we were going to be on blob, as it were, by the end of the year and COVID has thrown a spanner in the works? Um, how much do you expect the government to give you extra um, for COVID between now and March? And, and would that have a material effect on you know, balancing the books or would you still have to go for capitalisation no matter what? Yes, I think we would still have to go for capitalisation no matter what. Um, the funding that we receive from the government, specifically for COVID, all goes on COVID activities. Um, so it's you know supporting the most vulnerable, supporting um, uh, track and trace, that, that kind of thing. So all, all the funding that we get from the government goes on specifically on COVID activities. Um, the, the indirect impact of COVID is, is the issue, really, that's um, impacting our, our deficit. So it's the fact that um, we've not been able to make the savings because of uh, staff capacity. So for the first sort of, you know, three to four months as a result of COVID, none of the staff were working on uh, making the savings. They were all working on supporting the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, one of the savings proposals was to renegotiate contracts. Um, and the fragility of the market as a result of suppliers you know, experiencing difficulties with that. We're not able to um, to follow through on that. You know, it wouldn't be right to actually force suppliers to renegotiate contracts because the market is so fragile at the moment. So, um, so in terms of the direct impact of COVID, all the funding that we've received will go supporting that. But it's actually the indirect impact of COVID, which we are applying for a capitalisation directive for. Um, and MHCLG have said they will only give us a capitalisation directive for COVID related spend, the indirect COVID related spend. So if we had a new deficit of our own doing, if you like, yep. we, would still have to, we would still have to offset that ourselves. They wouldn't they wouldn't support us for that. OK, um, David Burgess, Joyce, you've got your hand up as well, if you'd like to ask a question of Cher. You there, David? David? David Burgess Joyce. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Okay, um, Cher, it was just uh, regarding the, the last point you made there, where you, you didn't feel comfortable about asking suppliers to, to uh, revisit their contract terms. Um, I was in, in, in another meeting um, quite recently with uh, with Graham Hodkinson, and, and he sent me an email today confirming that, that you had been asking for. 10% reductions across the board. So I'm just curious, really, because 10% is, is a decent figure, you know, when you're talking about 100 million in contract fees. So which is correct, Cher? Is it that you're not asking or that you are asking and not, not getting any response, really? Is that is the, the answer? Um, yeah, thanks, Councillor Burdish. I would say it varies, really. So um, our, our, our anticipated saving at the start of the year we were going to write to all suppliers, actually send them a letter um, to ask them to come and renegotiate the contracts with us. So we haven't done that. So we haven't approached um, any suppliers in the t in, uh, corporately in terms of a letter. What's happened is that some um, areas of the council have, uh, where they have a good relationship with suppliers, and I think adult social care is one anyway, um, what we would normally do this time of the year is we would go back to care homes and say, well, um, we do an exercise called the cost of care, where we ask them to submit to us um, how much they're actually uh, costing to provide care. And then we would go back to them and say, well, you know, we think that's appropriate or not, depending on the profit margins. Um, and then we would always kind of do a negotiation with uh, adult social care providers anyway. So that that is still ongoing. 
um, but this is kind of more like um, some of the other suppliers that uh, that we have across the council for general sort of council contracts, and that's where we've not really, well, we've not approached any of them really. But there has been some instances within public health where we have um, we are recommissioning at the moment and we are renegotiating contracts, but that's as part as a normal um, recommissioning exercise rather than a sort of a blanket um, renegotiation exercise. Right, it was just, it was just that really, you know, there's there's some significant money to be to be made there, isn't there, chair? But you know, obviously, there's a lot of private sector organisations who are revisiting their contracts because they appreciate that they're looking for savings across the the board, maybe even twenty percent. Uh, and I just wondered if we were missing a trick there by many of the suppliers would be happy to have eighty or ninety percent uh, now, and or as opposed to nothing later on, and which is whether we could uh, we could do across the board because we're talking some significant figures here and um, we must be able to make a dent into that uh, that, 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 that shortfall that we have and I think you mentioned about 50 million there must be some ability to do that across the board with all the contracts that the, the council has thanks Jeff. yeah yes um, absolutely and uh, one of the things we are taking forward for next year so we've, we've put it on hold we've not done it for this year but it, it is back in the plan for next year because um, what we've done is we've taken some uh, best practice from other councils and actually had a look what they've done and what we have found is that um, there are other councils where they have you're right they have made quite significant savings where we have been able to renegotiate the contracts so we will pick it up again um, and we are looking at it at the moment and it will be a, a new programme within next year's budget. So uh, we will absolutely do that. But just for this year, I think, uh, again, because of capacity with the um, the procurement team, more or less all of them were um, pulled out to work on PPE. Um, so uh, they, they weren't able to support that at the start of this year. But yeah, absolutely, we will pick it up again. Thanks, Cher. Could I just ask, Cher, um, how much of the deficit anticipated at the end of March wouldn't be covered by a capitalisation programme? So this year, um, I, uh, there's nothing, nothing that wouldn't be covered by a capitalisation programme this year. Yeah. So all of the deficit we're asking for is as a direct result of COVID um, for this year. Um, so all, all that is capitalisation. Next year, however, there is, um, uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there is, there's, we have round about 15 to 20 million pound pressures every year um, in general. And this is uh, as a result of increase in levies. So uh, Mersey travel levy, waste levy, um, contract inflation, uh, waste contracts as well, staff pay award increase in pensions. So generally, there are normal sort of um, around about 15, 20 million pounds worth of pressures. They're business as usual pressures, if you like. So uh, we haven't included those in next year's capitalisation directive because they're non-COVID related, they're normal sort of pressures. Yeah. Um, but for this year, um, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that isn't uh, COVID related uh, in, in that in the are contributing to our pressures. It's all COVID pressures. So basically, when it, when it comes to the start of the next financial year, it's going to be hitting the ground running and doing whatever we can to make savings so that um, by 21-22, with the capitalisation programme as well, we're back on an even keel. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, Mark, do you think it's fair to say that obviously with, with COVID-19 and the pressures that that's puts on your department, and obviously Cher's department as well, that um, although we've normally had audit and risk meetings really every other month, they're going to have to be, I think, far more frequently now to be able to um, bring the audit and risk committee up to date with what's going on and um, any um, queries and anything you think you need to bring to, to the committee that will be sort of COVID specific in terms of um, fraud, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, do you think it would be fair to say that we ought to be having meetings on a monthly basis? Or do you think that, uh, or we stick to every other month, but they're a lot longer? I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that trying to service a, a, a monthly meeting cycle would be very, very difficult and would create additional problems that, that, that we aren't encountering at the moment. I, I, right. I appreciate the point you make, Chair, about the need yeah. for sort of, you know, a more timely kind of reporting to yourselves, but I think monthly would be would be very difficult and I, okay. I think it would be almost counterproductive to be completely honest. Fine, yeah, okay, just thought I'd ask the question. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else, oh yes, uh, Ian Lewis, I've got to see your hand up. David, is yours still up from last time or did you want to ask another question? 
Uh, apologies, Chair, I'll put that down. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. So, Ian Lewis, please, if, Ian, if you'd like to direct your question to Cher and Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's, it's a question to all three, really. Picking up on Mark's last point, I uh, fully understand the work that we would be required to, uh, required to hold a, a formal meeting every month, but would it be uh, in order for you as Chair and the other party spokespeople to meet with Mark and Cher every month? That's fine by me. Uh, to, to you, Chair, um, arrangements are already in place for, for that to be happening. Lana. Um, we'd been undertaking similar kind of uh, meetings with the, uh, the, the the previous chair, Lana, whilst we were sort of, you know, um, navigating this this sort of pandemic. So I see no reason to change that. I think I think monthly yeah. meetings are, are, are important. Yes, definitely. Yeah. OK, thanks, Ian. Does anybody else have any questions um, on the item five Ian have you got another question or no, um, no sorry okay. um, so, uh, I can see in the chat box that Stuart Whittingham is saying vice chair and spokes also please yes uh, Ian Lewis did say that uh, yes chairs. yeah that's fine so yes you'd be included Stuart um, all right does anybody else want to ask a question Adrian no, thank you. No, okay, it's just that your your face is shouting out at me for some reason. So is there anybody else that wants to ask a question under internal audit update? No? Okay. Should we go on to agenda item six and the chief internal auditor's annual report and opinion? So Mark, if you want to present your report your report on agenda item six, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Be before I embark upon that, can, can we agree the recommendations, you think, for oh, the yes, internal audit update, if yes. that's okay? Thank you, yes. Chair. We all agree the recommendation by assent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. That's all right, no problem. Um, this uh, next report is um, it's my uh, annual report for 2019-20 seems a little bit kind of dated now like uh, but because of events that that have somewhat overtaken us kind of thing I, i'm presenting it now this is the first opportunity that i've had to actually sort of uh, present to yourselves however discussions did take place uh, throughout the pandemic with with the uh, with the previous chair and various other members of this committee in relation to the the the, the report and and the actual sort of the the overall summary that that's included within that report um the uh, as as a chief internal auditor, I'm required sort of mandatorily to uh, prepare and present an annual report that summarises the work undertaken by the internal audit service, and to provide an opinion as to the effectiveness of uh, the, the the assurance provided by the control environment in operation at the council. This is, as I say, an annual report. Um, now, the report that you have before you is, is just this. It's presented in a, in a style that's designed to comply with the uh, quite exacting requirements of the public sector internal audit standards and utilises a uh, fairly comprehensive recommended template that's been designed by them for this purpose. So it's presented in a certain way to, to accommodate those requirements. The opinion identified in the report reflects all of the work that was conducted for the 12 month period up to the 31st of March, 2020. Um, it, it includes and, and incorporates within it all actions taken by management to address weaknesses throughout the year and improve the overall control and governance arrangements and operation. The opinion is actually identified at section 1.3 of the report, page 56 of the uh, committee papers, and it's not too dissimilar to the opinion provided at this time last year. It simply reflects all the actions taken in year by management to address previously identified uh, issues from 2018-19 and any issues that were identified in order to conduct during 2019 and 20. It does acknowledge the actions taken by senior management to develop and improve the arrangements. The opinion does uh, also acknowledge that weaknesses in systems were identified in year um, and that where this had happened, positive engagement had taken place with management to agree quite specific actions to address those items. A list of some of the key issues identified during the year is included at section 2.4 on page 59 of the report. And members, I would hope, or certainly some of the members that, that were have been sitting on this committee for a while, may recall consideration of, of a number of these items during the year. So the actual opinion is based on an assessment of the, the overall governance arrangements, an assessment of the risk management arrangements and the framework in operation across the council. Uh, 
an assessment of the actual um, outcomes of our risk-based audit assignments that were conducted in year and an assessment of management's response to the audit recommendations and incorporating within that any progress made uh, in addressing those issues. So an evaluation of the actual opinions provided in all of the audit reports is included at section 2.3 on page 58 of the committee papers and again includes a comparison with the previous year's outcomes. Uh, opinions are provided, <coughs> excuse me, are not again too dissimilar to last year's. However, it is quite pleasing to note that there's a, certainly a reduction in the number of audits identifying a major uh, or moderate rating, which are the two highest categories of opinion provided. That does seem to indicate that some progress has been made. Uh, I would like to think so anyway. Attached to Appendix A to the report on page 65, the committee papers is a full breakdown of all of the audit assignments completed in year. And this identifies the opinions provided at that time and, and the numbers of actions agreed. Appendix B of the report, page 71, analyzes the follow-up audits completed. Uh, these are follow-ups that, that, that sort of chase up recommendations identified in, in full audit reports. Uh, and again, identifies the year-end status for agreed actions as, as being uh, that the majority of the actions have either been implemented with a number ongoing at this year, at the year-end, uh, and, and no, no uh, actions requiring uh, implementation at the, at the year-end. None of the actions were certainly identified as outstanding, which is uh, again encouraging. Section 3.1 of the report, to go back to page 61, includes information relating to the performance of, of my service uh, and includes outcomes in relation to the key performance indicators. These indicate that with the exception of the plan delivery indicator, which was directly impacted by COVID, preventing the completion of a number of assignments that were started during March, but we were unable to sort of uh, to, to, to finally close down like, uh, as a result of the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, it should be noted that the failure to achieve the planned delivery target has not adversely affected the overall opinion because the majority of that work was very near to completion and uh, has been utilised in, in fueling the actual opinion, overall opinion provided. Section 3.2 on page 61 of the committee papers I identify how the service, my service, complies with the requirements of the SIP for Best Practice Code and the public sector internal audit standards. And on section 3.3 on page 63, I do identify some challenges going forward uh, that, that COVID has certainly presented and the impact that this might have on my ability to provide an annual opinion for the year, uh, a, a, a point that, that Councillor Whittingham picked up earlier. Um, it's still somewhat unknown uh, that there will be an impact there. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, that pretty much concludes what I want to say about the report. Um, members are asked to note it. Uh, I am more than happy to take any questions that you you, you may have in relation to uh, any of the content. Um, sorry, uh, take Ian first and then Stuart Whittingham. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Claire, and thanks, Mark. Um, you particularly referenced uh, SIPFA's best practice um, and guidance. As you'll be aware, we've had an issue recently in terms of the membership of this committee. Uh, and who can and cannot serve on this committee if they are members either of uh, if they were either previously portfolio holders um, or if they are on the uh, policy and resources committee that we now have and I understand that guidance has been in place for two years can you tell me why was that guidance not spotted in the last two years I I, I can't to be to be brutally honest um the uh, the guidance, as you say, ha has always been there. Like on air, it, it, it is ultimately guidance that that we, as a, an organisation, decide to sort of uh, take on or, or, or not, as the case may be. But but certainly, it, it is best practice guidance. It's professional guidance by by the preeminent sort of uh, professional body in this field. Um, as 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 much, much as I can respond to that, really. Uh, Okay, so when you say that we've taken on, on board this, in terms of this report, you've taken on board SIPFA's advice and, and guidance, presumably in previous years, somebody somewhere must have decided not to do that. I, um, I'm applying this to, to my service. My service is an internal audit service that, that delivers a sort of uh, a plan of work right. yep. in, in a certain way. So I'm, I'm referring in this report to my internal audit service full compliance with the requirements of 
that's it for guidance as imposed upon me you know and i've chosen certainly to to apply that to the letter because i feel it, it's appropriate for me to do so in right. conjunction okay. with the the public sector internal auditing standards okay so when we when we talk about sit for guidance uh, and advice in this report we're talking specifically in terms of your role that's correct yes okay thank you thanks ian uh stuart whittingham Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mark, for the your report. Can I can I just ask, um, throughout all your uh, audits, have you come across any resistance from any of the officers, officers or departments involved, and have they been cooperative and uh, welcoming of uh, any findings? Through you, Chair, um, they have. Yeah, uh, I've had. Uh, I have a very good working relationship with uh, the senior management team. Um, they all appreciate the work that we do, and certainly are supportive of, of the uh, the outcomes from from internal audit. They see us as a uh, a facilitator for or you know for, for development and, and positive change. So um, there are on occasions uh, issues that materialise as a result of a uh, conflicting demand, perhaps on 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 lower level managers who are trying to juggle a number of kind of uh, deliveries one of which might be to to implement a, a number of actions that have uh, resulted from audit reports so uh no more than that i would say there have certainly uh been very few occasions that i can recall that i've had to come to yourselves as an audit committee and request that you uh have a conversation with uh, individual officers and invite officers along to the committee to to answer questions in relation to a lack of progress with regards to uh audit recommendations and actions you may recall there have been one or two occasions throughout that 12 month period so uh overall it's 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 very positive you'll see from the follow-up work undertaken that, that summarized within my report that uh there were no kind of outstanding actions at the year end again which is very positive the, there were recommendations that had either been implemented or, or were in the process of, of you know in, in train shall we say with regards to implementation which again is is very positive um so um i think that answers your question councillor thank you Stuart. um ian is your hand still up do you want to ask another question no? apologies no. Yeah, apologies thanks um is there anybody else that wants to ask a question on agenda item six for mark no if i could just summarize i, I think probably going forward the um the pie chart on page 58 will probably look hopefully not but possibly different at the end of 2021 and, and i know we'll all give mark our support in making sure that uh, his team mm. have the resources to carry out uh, what will I'm sure be an onerous task in the next financial year uh, in making sure that those areas that are at the moment major uh, are dealt with and brought down and that anything that's hopefully moderate doesn't escalate any further but we, we know there's going to be in next year probably another section for COVID-19. Um, so um, I just hope everything uh, works out the way we hope it will and we'll all give you our support mark in making sure and of course as chair of the this committee if there's anything you want to bring to the um committee outside the normal uh, realm of the meeting then by all means do um so it's just if there's nobody else has a question for mark then it just brings me to ask that uh, members of the audit and risk management committee note the report is that okay with everyone yes Thank you. Okay. So agenda item seven is the corporate risk management update. And so I'll invite Cher Hale, the Director of Resources, to present her report to the members and then to the members to ask questions and comment as appropriate. Thanks, Cher. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so uh, just for the benefit, I guess, of, of new members, so uh, the Corporate Risk Register comes to the committee every uh, quarter or every time there's a committee on. Um, and we also have or had a, a cross-party subgroup, risk, uh, work, risk working group, um, cross-party of members who would meet periodically um, in between the committee to really have a, a sort of a deep dive and a detailed look at the individual risks in the Corporate Risk Register. Um, uh, and ask some questions and um, 
uh, task the officers really my uh, risk team with going away and um, actually having a look at the risks and making sure that they were fit for purpose. So this is just um, an update and it's just for the committee to note this report. Um, the last time we had a, a member risk workshop was in the summer and this was as a result um, obviously to, to double check the risks that were still in the in the corporate risk register which last came to the committee in March. Um, as a result of COVID, there has been um, some questions as to whether those risks are still valid that are in the corporate risk register, whether they still need to actually be in there, whether they could be demoted to the uh, director at risk register, as every director also has um, a risk register of their own, um, or whether there is any risks indeed in the director at risk registers that need to be escalated um, onto the corporate risk register. So there may be some occasions where the scoring might be different now. Um, there might be some more emphasis in terms of the risks and there might be some more priorities that have come forward. So this is a report just to update members of the committee really on what the officers have been doing, my officers have been doing in terms of looking at the corporate risk register in light of COVID-19 um, and the impact that's had on the risk register. Um, and we have had a session with our strategic leadership team recently, the SLT, um, and uh, I've tasked them with actually looking at the individual risks within the corporate risk register, and as I mentioned just before, within the directorate risk register as well, to see whether they are um, right, fit for purpose, and whether um, anything else needs to be included in there. So we've asked SLT four questions, really. Um, and these are that um, are, are these the risks that the uh, strategic leadership team are most worried about and have most cause to concern? Are they the risks they do want to monitor? Um, and do we need to provide some additional insurance to make sure that they're being well managed? Um, are the descriptions of the risks actually actually accurately, should I say, reflecting the risks that are in there? So do we understand what the risks are and what we need to do about them? Um, are they right for inclusion, as I mentioned before, as on the corporate register, or should they be on the directorate register? And actually, is there anything missing? So in light of COVID or indeed anything else that's um, come to light, um, and especially the impact of Brexit now, are the risks actually correct um, or is there anything missing in terms of uh, what's on there? So I've included the corporate risk register um, in the report as Appendix 1. Um, what I'm really updating the committee on is that uh, we, we know that they will change um, and that, uh, that's what I've tasked the SLT with doing uh, at the moment and we'll bring that back to the next um, Audit and Risk Committee. Does link in with a couple of other things that have happened recently or are likely to happen recent, recently in terms of what we've been doing corporately. So there is a review of the Wirral plan um, in light of COVID to make sure that the plan can reflect the council's priorities still and that they're still right. So the, the register, risk register will um, link into the uh, the outcomes and the themes within the Wirral plan. And there is also um, a new corporate performance management framework that we are implementing where there will be more accountability uh, the corporate management team in terms of looking at the overall uh, performance of the whole council not just on risk uh, but in uh, all, all the areas of the of the council and uh, risk will actually form the basis of that uh, corporate performance uh, management framework so as I say, the um, the report really is just to inform um, yourselves as a committee that we haven't been doing nothing. Uh, we have been updating this and, and looking at it, and we will bring a report back to the next committee as to um, a refreshed version of that corporate risk register for the committee's consideration. So I'll just pause there, Chair, if there's any questions on that report. Yeah, I can't see any hands up at the moment. Is there anybody else that wants? Oh, yeah, Joe Bird, Councillor Joe Bird. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this is my first Audit and Risk Management Committee and I've not yet completed the training that's, that's available, um, though that'll be forthcoming in the next week or two, I understand. So, and my question is around the, the, the risks to staff and residents of care homes. Um, we've seen across the country thousands of people put at risk and, and dying from COVID from the policy of releasing people from a hospital who haven't went and weren't tested and just a few days ago amnesty international is, is repeating that risk and is saying you know what and urging councils to take the necessary measures to stop a repeat of that in in the current wave and any future wave of that and it, 
And I noticed on the, the corporate risk register, register it is mentioned, but there isn't a lot of detail in that. And I would urge it to be, you know, a high, high priority. You were talking about saving saving lives, which is the key priority of the council and the government. And, and perhaps, you know, because some actions I think were taken that were consistent with government guidance, but maybe there are other factors to take into account as well as, as to which um, policies are implemented directly or which are amended in some way. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Bird. I mean, you're right, this is exactly where the risk register, you know, does definitely needs to be updated in light of what's happened with the with the COVID pandemic. Um, and there will be 100% more priorities um, uh, that need to go in the risk register that, that are included in there at the moment. Uh, I suppose just in terms of that specific one you mentioned, um, it is my understanding that council actually doesn't have any influence over um, discharges from hospital into care homes. So I think that has come through. Um, that's the NHS guide. Uh, I'm not 100% certain about that. That's that's as, as far as my understanding. But what we do need to do, um, you know, that, that as you say, that is uh, we're all residents that we're talking about, and um, the council does have an obligation to make sure that all we're all resident res residents are um, protected from harm and, and not vulnerable as as far as we can within our responsibilities. So yeah, we will have a look at that and see, um, you know, if there is any influence we can have over that and how we can work uh, more closely with the health sector in kind of aligning. The those responsibilities yes thank you thanks joe um councillor tony cox has got a, a question thanks yeah uh share i'm just looking at the uh, risk register and it's uh, item 24 which is information management it is, is the word incorrect in that the council is not compliant with relevant data and information management? If it is, thank you for your candidness. Um, if it is correct, what are we doing about it? Because I'd hate to see us fall foul of the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, I'm presuming we're talking GDPR. Uh, can you just give us a, a, a bit more meat on the bones there as to exactly what it's referring to and what we're doing about it? Thanks. OK, I can't, unfortunately, Councillor Cox at the moment. I haven't got that level of detail. I mean, I can certainly get that that for you. I, I do know there is one area we're not compliant, which is um, PCI. I think it's called PCI DSS, which is about credit card charging. And um, we have got a programme in place at the moment where um, we are trying to get compliance with that. This is costly, as I understand, but we are not compliant with that. But, I mean, that is definitely one area. I'm not entirely sure of um, the other areas of where we're not compliant, but I, I can uh, find that information out for you. Um, I noticed that Phil has his, has his hand up and may have to share some more information to help me out on this one. Phil, yeah. do you want to answer? Sorry, just, just to reassure Councillor Cox, that's not a statement, that's a description of the risk. So the risk is that we're not compliant. Not yes, thank you. Not. I was wondering if, if it was wording rather than yeah. actual fact. OK, thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Phil. Anybody else got any questions? No? Joe Bird? Thanks. Could I just ask a follow up question on the same issue there? So presumably, well, um, well, this is my question because I don't know, actually know the answer, but to, be, to go onto the corporate risk register, there must be some threshold of risk that's already been passed for, for that risk to have been realised. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So there's a scoring mechanism um, that's on there. So uh, it, each of the directors, as I mentioned before, will have a director at risk register. We have um, a risk officers group and they meet on it or they, they were previously meeting on a, a monthly basis or a, a bi-monthly basis. What they would do is assess all the risks in the director at risk register and determine whether they do they would feel that they were a sufficient high score that they, that they would make an appearance on the corporate risk register. What they would happen uh, then is they would go to SLT um, and SLT would either agree or otherwise as to whether they would, should appear on there. But normally I think it's um, determined on the scoring. Uh, so there's some of the risks are on the register for information and that we need to uh, be aware of them um, and they may well change. Some of them will come in and out depending on the severity. But if they take a certain score then I think they will automatically be uh, recorded on the corporate risk register yeah thanks and would this audit and risk committee's views be taken on board as the, the placing on the corporate register or the removal of it as well Yes, absolutely, Councillor Bird. So I mentioned before that we had um, a cross-party risk workshop, a, a working group, 
Um, I think, uh, apart from one member, the other three, so there was four members on that group, three members who are no longer on the committee. Um, so my recommendation really would be um, is that we would still uh, carry on with that, that, that working group um, and ask the new members to go on that so that um, members can really have, have um, it was really beneficial because uh, the members of the group were really able to get into the bones of some of the risks and really uh, get into the de detail and have a deep dive. And then their recommendations will be brought forward to the committee, the next committee. The committee would then have a debate on whether they thought the recommendations would be uh, valid or not, or whether they would want to change some of those. OK, Mark, you've got your hand up. Did you want to reply to Joe Bird's questioning? Hey, it was just to... I know Stuart has. I'll come to you in a second, Stuart. Go on, Mark. Look. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it, it was basically to support what Chair was saying with regards to the risk work, the member risk workshop. Uh, Chair's probably covered it all now, to be brutally honest, like, but I was just going to allude to that like because it was important. It did contribute significantly, uh, and I think it will do going forward. So um, Chair's well covered it. And the other point was very, very briefly, if you don't mind, Chair, in response to Councillor Cox's question on information governance, um, uh, it, it, it's on the risk register because clearly there are potentially significant risks associated with with being compliant but also that as a direct result of the way in which we're all having to work at the moment like in a remote sort of agile way it enhances the risks associated with maintaining effective control over that that data that that that, that sort of uh the sensitive confidential data that is now sitting in people's homes on laptops and the like so that the, you know it is has certainly enhanced and, and promoted that risk so it's relevant for it to be there like and, and, and we certainly from an internal order perspective have a number of targeted pieces of work that will be undertaken over the next few months to, to try and scratch the surface on that and, and you'll be the recipients of, of the outcomes from from those targeted work areas yes. uh, that, that was it thank you chair thanks mark um, Stuart kelly uh, thanks chair uh, just just looking at the the register uh corporate risk number eight um dealing with significant safeguarding incidents um well, a number of years ago when I was last on, on, on this committee, that was actually separated out into two specific risks, one involving a safeguarding incident uh, involving children and the other one more general uh, or adults, if you like. So children and adults were, were separated and they appear to have been remerged, um, no matter. Um, what, I, what I don't follow in, the, um, in that particular column um is the comment or revision that's in place in in that sort of purpley colour children's considering refocusing of risk I'm, I'm not sure what i understand what refocusing uh means um because the risk is is re reasonably clear what we're talking about in terms of a significant safeguarding in incident involving children so so what what does refocusing mean in this context uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, so I think uh, what it probably means. I'm not. I'm not. I haven't got the, the specific detail with me, but I think what it means is um, there is a potential for that risk to go higher um, as a result of uh, the impact of COVID. So we know, as a result of the impact of COVID, that there are um, potential additional safeguarding issues for children um, who have been, uh, you know, at home sort of uh, as a result of lockdown in with. Um, uh, sort of potential safeguarding incidents within the home there so i think the uh, director of children's services is just taking a look at that risk just to see whether it's still appropriate and it's still um right and whether it might need to be uh, more of a higher priority in light of what we know as a result of covid okay just, just to follow there, there is nothing higher than the corporate risk register though is that in, in a sense if it's if it's not there, there's nothing there's not another list that goes on uh, no there so it's the main one isn't it it is the main one yeah but it may be that the score uh, the scoring might be higher and um, so we might actually uh, decide that it's actually a, a more severe scoring um, and in which case we would put more resources to it the action plan will be more robust and we would monitor it um you know a lot a lot more closely okay. mark do you want to come in on that one i know you put that to correct share in the chat box 
to confirm what Chair was saying, I wasn't sure how uh, confident Chair was in, in, in the statement you were making there. So, so you were one hundred percent correct in, in terms of sort of you know what what why it's there and, and the fact that it could escalate like and in terms of its scoring could go up significantly as a direct result of some of the COVID uh, related activity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, um, Cher and Mark. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions for Cher or Mark on agenda item seven, co corporate risk management update? Um, Stuart, no? Mark, right. Do you want to go on to agenda item eight? Mark, your hand's still up. Do you want to speak on this one before I go on to agenda item eight? No? Okay. Apologies. So, <laughs> Agenda item eight. Um, so there's um, share director resources, and I know Keith Patterson's here as well, head of commercial procurement, to present the report and invite members' questions and comments. Uh, before that, uh, agenda item seven. The recommendation is that members of the audit and risk management committee note the report. Is that okay? By assent. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. So agenda item eight. Chair and uh, Keith, please. Yep, thank you, Chair. I'm going to um, hand uh, straight over to Keith, if you don't mind, um, to yeah. present this report. Um, as you're quite right, as you said, is, is Head of Procurement. Thank you, Keith. OK. Uh, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Members. Uh, this report covers two themes that make up the procurement update. Part one is to do with contracts and part two is to do with no PO, no pay. Uh, the contract section is an update of two consecutive terms of six months. Normally, we would report on the last six months, but because of the uh, the COVID interruption, uh, I found it uh, necessary to report on two consecutive periods. On section uh, 3.6 of the report, it talks about the number of exception requests that have been submitted in this period. Uh, and on 3.7, uh, it sets out a table of uh, the number of exception requests, extensions, variations and awards. Uh, the committee should note that the exception numbers there, which are recorded as 61, should actually read as 60. Uh, this is because the accompanying um, um, appendix uh, does not have a record number 21. So the total number is actually 60 exception requests. Compared to our previous um, equivalent terms, um, exception requests are reduced um, by around about 30 um, and um, extensions and variations remain stable. Uh, awards um, have reduced significantly from 30 in the previous period to nine in this period. Um, Chair, I wonder whether it's worth taking questions on this section of the report now before I move on to no PO, no pay. Uh, yes, if anybody wants to ask any questions of Keith on this report. Anybody got any questions so far? If I could just ask then, Keith, on the exceptions, uh, how many of these are COVID related? Do you know? Uh, I don't know the answer to that because there, there wouldn't be a, I mean, some things are recorded with COVID in the text of the of the messages, but there isn't a separate recording feature on the on the application form for a request that says, you know, what does this relate to? So that would be a really tricky one for me to, to respond to. And how, so has that increased significantly over the previous year at all? Uh, the number of exception requests has reduced. Okay. Has anybody else got any questions to ask on that bit? Oh, Kate Cannon, your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. Um, it was actually uh, along the similar lines to Cathy's question, which is, you know, um, because obviously the procurement's changed through the COVID Act um, that we had um, for the local authority, I suppose I was just wondering, has that had any effect on your procurement and the way in which that we've actually had to, to either extend contracts or go out and find different contracts under a different piece of legislation? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, um, there were significant um, you know, changes in the way that we had to operate within the procurement team to, uh, to put things in place. Um, but we've remained compliant with all of the appropriate regulations during that period. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Keith. And you've not had too many concerns about that, and it's not either in, in, it has enabled you to do your job as opposed to perpetuity. 
Yeah, uh, not not at all. Um, we, we've worked within the regulations and at pace through the whole COVID situation. I, I'd just like to make a bit of a bragging point, really, that, that yeah. we're, all, we're all never ran out of PPE. Um, we were successful in making sure that, that um, we always had sufficient PPE, even though we resourced it from all over the world. Oh, that's absolutely fabulous, Keith. Um, as I said, it's, it's a wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks Councillor. Thanks, Keith. I have to put you on Sky News for that little bit of uh, information. I, I was actually on the ITV well news chair at one point. Well done. Um, did you want to go on to the section four, no PO, no pay, Keith? Sure. Yes. Yeah, oh, hang on. Sorry, Ian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sure. can, I, can I just say, um, several of us um, volunteered at the PPE hub during the, the first round of the, the outbreak. And I have to say the feedback from everybody that was coming to the hub to collect the PPE or the recipients where it was being delivered to were nothing but complimentary about the council about the work that they'd done to secure PPE and some of the organisations were actually absolutely desperate for PPE and the staff of this council Keith Patterson and all the team Matthew Humble everybody else really pulled out all the stops and it really was appreciated. Fan club Keith, fan club. I'm very very grateful for that recognition and um, I take it on behalf of my team who worked really really hard long hours every weekend some of them never had a day off for over six weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Does anybody else want to make a comment? No. Okay. Keith, if we go on to section four. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, there's been an extensive focus on OPO no pay, and progress has been reported to uh, this committee um, at the uh, each ordinary uh, meeting since September last year. Uh, and as a result, we've committed a programme of intensive training, uh, which was conducted by procurement staff from October 2019 to January 20. We also continued with individual um, services with workshops that were conducted during January and March. Uh, and um, because of the COVID, we were obviously clearly there were interruptions uh, and we carried on with that from June to the present day. Uh, these workshops uh, uh, of, as, as I said before, we're interrupted by uh, the COVID situation, but we have continued them since. Another point I'd like to make in 4.3 is that when payments were transferred to me in April, um, the committee will recall that we had um, some vacancies in the payments team at that time. And we obviously considered that was an important um, issue to consider um, in respect of no PO, no pay. So um, I'd like to confirm that these vacancies have now been filled and they were filled by June. We also had one long term sick um, person in the team and we also had a backlog of 400 invoices at that time. Uh, so um, since then, we've addressed all of those issues. Uh, and in fact, our payment performance during October was that 30 days payments, we were achieving 98.1%. And to 10 days payment, we were achieving 97.43%, which is the payments we make to SMEs. This was always going to be a critical factor in delivering no PO, no pay, because we had to ensure that the payments team was sufficiently resourced and had the sufficient capacity to fulfil the extra transactions that would come their way that would not normally be recorded as freestanding invoices. Just for the purposes of those who perhaps aren't aware, a freestanding invoice is a transaction that doesn't have a purchase order and a, uh, and a retrospective purchase order is a transaction where a bit of PO, a purchase order has been created after the invoice has been received. In 4.5, um, I can report that, um, that some of our measures have had some impact uh, on transaction volumes, especially in view of the freestanding invoices where we've reduced by 48%. Retrospective orders have also reduced by 12%, uh, but also, uh, and our standard purchase order va uh, values have increased by 29%. Uh, uh, retrospective order volumes have reduced by 12%, and retrospective order values have reduced by 12%. Freestanding invoices, as I indicated earlier, have reduced by 48%. In 4.7, um, you will note that, that there is a, a, a table that indicates the progress with respect to uh, freestanding invoices. So you will note that um, 
a number of services um, that we've looked at have now converted from freestanding invoices into purchase order transactions. So regeneration and place, um, you'll see that they're recorded twice, one for self-certificates for construction and one for supported housing, which is actually quite a significant volume. Also children's transport and also public health. So we've made progress and they are now converted into purchase orders. PFI is recorded as AMBA because as of today, they have not yet converted to purchase orders, but we are supporting them in, in creating those orders. The section above that's, that's not highlighted, which is children and families, externally looked after children and child placements and children with disabilities. We've, no, we've worked significantly with the services on, on this and we find that these transactions are not appropriate for purchase orders and would be appropriate for use in the council's uh, care management system, uh, which is um, Liquid Logic and Controck. This is because these are extremely complex transactions at times uh, and can involve the placements of children um, in, a, in a placement um, almost immediately and might even involve a child being moved from one placement to another, even in the same day. So they're just, just not suited for purchase orders. There's no way a purchase order could, could deal with that. There are also complex funding and budgeting um, things around these trans transactions as well. So it just makes it impossible. They, we have agreed with the service that these um, transaction types will convert into the electronic system of, of liquid logic. Thank you, Keith. I can see two hands up, um, Ian Lewis and David Burgess Joyce. So, Ian, do you want to go go first? I'm sorry, Claire, I keep doing this. I will beg your pardon. Um, David? Yeah, yeah good, good, good evening, Keith. Thanks. But thanks very much for uh, for that. Quite uh, quite useful. Uh, just really a bit of a clarification, Keith, uh, and forgive me if I, I've got this completely wrong. But I noticed that schools don't have direct access to your procurement system, and yet it looks like they make up nearly a third of all of the uh, procurement uh, purchase orders. Um, is, there, is there a particular reason for that, and would that sort of lighten the load for you, or would it actually make things worse for you? Uh, in reality, so you just have to pick up those two. If you could just clarify that, please. Yes, uh, through, through the chair. Uh, yes, uh, these transactions do not involve schools. Um, although it's recorded as children and family and education, this is actually more the corporate side of the of the um, um, the running of the school service. So, so they're they're completely separate to schools, uh, councillor. Thanks, David. Um, Stuart Whittingham. Thanks, Chair, and it'd be remiss for me not to offer my congratulations and thanks to your team, Keith, for all the sterling work you've done uh, over the pandemic. Um, so in terms of the no PO, no pay, um, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to see uh, you've made notes in 4.7 about you know, the, the challenges facing placements uh, and wherever your children's services. Um, now, given that... Um, would it be not sensible not to report on them now uh, as part of this report because it may may well may well be you no know, skewing the skewing the figures uh, in terms of the number of uh, no POs uh, no pay uh, contributions uh, that are happening across the organisation. Um, Sorry, it's, it's it's not clear to me what the question is. I'm sorry. I think what Stuart's asking is that that the. Um, the invoice type for children, family and education um, under section 4.7 uh, 4 where there are 40% of all freestanding yeah. invoices uh, were children and families. I think we should still report on them, but as long as um, the committee is made aware of, of how it fits in within the overall picture, mm -hmm. I don't think we should discount it. Um, but I think unless somebody wants to say to the, to the contrary, I think we all understand what that what that means. Chair, 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 in response to the question then, um, those transactions will appear um, in the table, if you can see above in 4.6. Yeah. They, they, they will, once they've gone on to a contract or liquid logic, they will reappear as um, an electronic internal file from digital systems. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll still appear, but in a different format. Is, is, yes. is that the case for uh, 
for care packages, you know, uh, through adults. Is that the case uh, with the same same case with uh, care packages for adults? Correct. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Keith, could I could I just ask a question? I know on section four four point four that the um, the analysis compares the six month period April to September uh, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty nineteen, and on the no purchase orders, although the um, the volume has gone down significantly, the actual physical you know, financial amount hasn't. Is is that is that because of COVID and sourcing PPE? Trick, tricky one yeah tricky one this because because they're freestanding invoices we don't have any line detail or dis description as you would get on a purchase order transaction so they are basically coming in with just a value set against the transaction which is very hard to analyze so in order to truly understand that we'd probably have to go through thousands of transactions to try and build a profile of what of, of why that is chair because the, pro the problem is when it, when it comes to us at the committee here, um, if you were to see the volume um, reduced by 50%, uh, you would generally expect on balance, but not totally specifically, to see the value amount drop significantly, and, and it hasn't. Um, so, I mean, I could understand if it's COVID related, it's PP and it's a one-off, but going forward, um, if the if the volume drops but the value and for me the value is more important than the actual number of transactions um because how how do do we um how do we manage or audit uh invoices without a purchase order number um yeah. being scrutinized i think share okay. wants to come in on that one uh well, can I respond before? Yes, yes, sure. certainly, Keith. Yeah, you so, respond first. So I can't. I kind of think there are two things to that. Uh, one is if we if we look at the main um, thrust of those transactions, we've already said that they they lie essentially with children's services, um, and with you know those other services which are highlighted in the greens and the ambers, yeah. and the externally look after children. So the answer to the to your question lies in those transactions somewhere. So is that 53%, 53% of that total volume of 4,840 and the total value yeah. lies in children's services? Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. And so somewhere along the line, can we can we um, strip out how much is children's services and how much is everything else and just look at the everything else? Yeah, because um, the second point I was going to make, Chair, is that, that um, because we've made so much progress um, yeah. with these transaction types, um, the, the next time we present this report, the expectation is there won't be any freestanding invoices. Is, oh, good, yeah. Um, because, that, because that's the point that we've got to. So um, we've we've made such good progress on this. So it's it's not likely I'll need to report on this for the next meeting. Sorry, share. Thank you, um, share. Yeah, thank you, share. Just just to pick up uh, Keith's point, really. I think I think the fact that there's no freestanding invoices may be a little bit ambitious, but um, you know, we would we would definitely hope that they would be significantly reduced. Keith and his team have done, um, as he says, a significant amount of work in getting these down. Uh, which has really helped. But um, we've had a bit of a discussion about this report, our DMT, and Keith and I have discussed this as well. And I think what we uh, said that we would do is for the free freestanding invoices that are not children's, with um, notwithstanding what Keith said, you know, there are thousands and thousands of transactions. Yeah. What we would do is have a look um, at the highest value ones um, and just test and pull out some of the highest value ones to see yeah. why um, they're, go they're going through as freestanding invoices. Yeah. Um, and we have a different reporting mechanism now internally is that where we have retrospective purchase orders and freestanding invoices, they will come through the corporate governance group, which they, they didn't do before. So if there are um, persistent kind of offenders, really, um, we can spot those and we'll test, as I say, some of the highest value ones and um, ask directly, you know, the question of the directors as to um, as to why this is still happening and what we can do to support them to make sure it doesn't continue. Yeah, thanks. Um, David Burgess Joyce has um, indicated in the chat box that optimism optimism <laughs> is good Keith and I agree 
It's lovely to see somebody with such a great attitude. Thank you, Keith. Um, <laughs> did you want to go? Is there any? Is there any? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go any go further now. On okay. actually, after that, we're on four point eight. Are we? No. Yeah. yeah five. Five. Nobody else seems to want to ask a question. So carry on, Keith. The floor is no, yours. No, so, so, so just picking up on Cher's previous points about analysing the transactions and where a lot of these seem to lie in terms of value. So because these, because I'm now looking at um, retrospective purchase orders, I'm able to, to, to tell you what that analysis looks like, and I'll come to that in a second, if that's okay, Chair. Uh, so what we can see at the moment is a table of um, retrospective per, uh, purchase orders in 4.8. So although we've seen, um, you know, reduction um, in the numbers, a slight reduction, um, we can see that the we haven't had quite the same success with RPOs, respective uh, retrospective purchase orders that we've had with freestanding invoices. Uh, so they have reduced, but not not anywhere near the same level. Um, and what you can see in front of you are is the table of services who are the main culprits for RPOs. So clearly. Yeah. We can see is the neighbourhood services, services, children's, um, uh, are the standouts departments um, for the highest volumes, uh, with you know obviously numbers uh, built up by all the other services. So uh, no no service is free of uh, con uh, completing a retrospective purchase order. So um, uh, I just want to illustrate that we've worked tirelessly with. Um, with services and departments to try and improve this picture. It's not it's not down, down to us in procurement. We work tirelessly to do this. But clearly there's still more work to be done. And as Cher alluded to, um, we are now um, going to be reporting this through the corporate governance group. Uh, just to give you uh, an indication of the um of the value of some of these transactions, we analyzed the top 26 um purchase uh, retrospective purchase orders. Um, and this came to 8.7 million, so quite a significant part of that 18 million was based on 26 purchase orders that were raised. And a lot of these were raised either for Will Community uh, NHS um, or, or uh, PFI or actually West, West Kirby Residential School. They, they made up the 8.7 million. So it's not it's not impossible for us to chalk off a significant value set from those transactions just by focusing on some of these and some of the other, the other higher value ones. So that was the piece of work that I did share that you asked me to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Keith so far on this report? No. Oh, yeah. No, no. Adrian, no. No hands Good going thing. up. Or is there? No. Anybody else? No, floor's yours again, Keith. Uh, well, that, that actually com concludes my report, Chair. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for Keith at all? No. Um, I've just got one, Keith. Um, on the contract exception report, all values above 50,000, um, I have mentioned before about us having a report that um has the annual spend and the total contract spend and then the total contract term so that we can put the annual spend and the total contract amount into some context um could you just explain to me um where you've got some of the figures say on item one where you've got an annual spend of 31111 pound 11 on uh resources um, payment payment services post office pay point and the total contract spend is 70,000 could you just put that into some context for me right uh, f firstly chair I would illustrate that the columns are marked at the top with annual spend and total contract spend don't, don't relate to actual spend they relate to contract estimates placed on the document by the commissioner so they are there to allow us to understand what the thresholds of these values actually are to enable, enable us to understand who can, who conducts the approval process. To, to, so they are not spend figures, they are contract estimate figures. And um, the annual spend and the total contract spend, we are a relationship between the two in terms of the term of the contract and the, and the 
you know, the annual cost of that contract. Right. So on, on item one, the annual spend for the financial year was 31,111. And the, the contract amount, the approximate contract amount yeah. um, is, so, is 70,000. But we don't. So how do we contextualise that in terms of um, how long the contract is for and and whether or not um, the 70,000 approximation is ever breached? OK, so for the first point I'd make, Chair, is that the it is the total contract spend, is, is, which is our main tool for evaluating the the, um, the approval of the contract, because that's the way the yep. approvals work. It's based on the contract and not the annual contract. Yeah. OK, so so that is the rule. So um, when we receive a notification from a service, it will have a period that a, the contract is to be set for. And that value set will be used as to who approves it. We do a sort of back calculate, or there is a back calculation in there that, that says, well, if a contract is two years uh, and it's £100,000, then it should be 50000 a year. That's the way that we work it out. Yeah. But, but I'm, I've got to say that we are reliant on the information put on the form by the commissioners, and they're not always great at being accurate with that information. Right. Um, and in fact, since the 1st of September, we changed we changed the way in which we manage information through the form. So we've gone on to something called a procurement smart form, which provides us with far more accurate information and a far better and more robust approval process. So now these forms, um, before they even get to procurement, go through three other stages. They go through um, uh, the head of service, they, they go through the budget holder, and then more importantly, they go through finance to agree the budget, the yeah. budget provisions. So, so the I think the information on that document, their chair, can be misleading in the way it's described. Right. So it it needs to come to committee in a format that um, isn't misleading, that Correct. is accurate. Because um, because looking at it, so for instance, on that, just as a as an example, item one. Um, it, that seventy thousand contract spend. If it was a four-year contract, you'd be looking at seventeen and a half thousand a year. Correct. Yeah. So we'd need to have a column saying four-year contract, and that this annual spend, whether or not that was, uh, well, for instance, an annual spend of thirty-one thousand one hundred eleven on a four-year contract. If this was one year spend, would be um, would be almost twice what the contract annual yeah. spend should be because you would expect it to be seventeen and a half thousand. Um so in terms of being as as a committee being able to understand these figures, the the report format in the future should show the spend in the financial year, the total con contract amount, um the 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 term of the contract and and whether it's uh, to date an overspend or underspend. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, a couple of comments, Chair. Yeah, fir firstly, it's my intention in the next uh, report to provide a report that has a start date, an end date, a contract period in months, and the budget source, because we're able to include that now. So yep. you'll know exactly which bu budget that's come from, whether that's come from um, uh, revenue or whether it's come from uh, capital or resources. Um, if it's a multiple um, budget source, it will strike as multiple. You'll see that on the report because obviously it would be difficult to break break that down into different components. In yeah. terms of the actual spend, this can be tricky with exception requests, Chair, because they can be numerous in number and it means that in order to track spend on them, uh, we have to, en to ensure that there's only one record for a supplier in our supplier file. If we create extra records, which would help us do this tracking, what it would mean is that when people come to create a purchase order, a non-catalog purchase order, order, they won't know which supplier to select because there'll be multiple records of different suppliers. So that would make it quite tricky to do. So what we, what I could do, Chair, is include in the report any lines that's in there which have a transaction that belongs only to a single supplier in the payments file. Otherwise, yep. the information will be will be distorted. Does yep. that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. But what proportion would you say 
of all these here, because there are, oh, let, me, let me just have a look, 90 something, I think, or 100, yeah, 107, there's 107 items. So what proportion, and you might not know this off the top of your head, what proportion of those 100, 107 will be single contract that we, it would be easy to put into the formula that you've just suggested? Yeah. OK, so so based on that, um, I think we got to about five or six in that list. Five or six are multiple. No, five or six are single. Oh, so nine. So, so basically 102. A lot, are multiple. A, lot of, a lot of them are multiple suppliers. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I have got some analysis chair on the on the five that we analysed in terms of yeah, the contract okay. spend, if that's any good. Yes, please. Yeah. OK, so on line 12, um, we looked at the supplier active eight. The start date of that contract was the 1st of December last year, and the end date is the 20th of June next year. So it's a 19 month contract. The contract provision on that was 290k. Yep. Uh, the spend so far is 117k, which means that the forecast on that looks like it would be 185k if that spend um, trend continues. Line 22, Amion. So 185 will be the so because the the the, the contract amount is 290, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, contract provision, the contract provision is 290. So you're saying it's going to come under budget or under contract amount? I'm saying that if the trend of the spend continues in the way that it has, it, it will come out at 185k. Right, right. And and if it's a 19 month contract, how often is it is it looked at? Because you, you, you could find that it's spent 117 so far, but it's yeah. top loaded towards the end of the contract. Yeah, term, that, could so. yeah that, that, that could happen, Chair. Um, so would it be looked at every if it's 19 months you know would it be looked at sort of every maybe sort of three or four months to see if it's on on blob for meeting okay. its contract term well yeah. the, other, the other point the point i'd make chair in terms of looking at contract spend and so on and um, although we're looking at quite a small number of the contracts that we actually award um in real, in real terms, what we want to be doing is analysing the contracts which we are re, 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 um, resubmitting or, or reappointing, um, and we're putting into place a contract spending um, analysis provision to enable us to, to closely monitor now all contracts spend. Because we put these new forms in place, we've now got the budget information. We're now working on connecting up that budget information to a contract and the contract links to the payment system. Up to now, those three things did not link. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have no way of tracking spend. So yep. our focus is going to be on those contracts that we've done through tendering uh, and we've awarded through a tendering process. And we'll be able to understand the relationship of that contract and its original spend. And if, and if there's any potential overspends or underspends, and we can take some action or remedial action during the course of the contract's life rather yes. than wait till the end when a contract is suddenly overspent um, and we have to find that finance from, from somewhere else yep. so we put all those things in place and, and i think that ties in share doesn't it with um the um what's going to have to happen in the next financial year in terms of capitalization yeah. and making sure yeah. um that basically that overspend is um is is monitored very closely correct to stay yeah. with the budget yeah. absolutely chair yeah and keith i think as keith mentioned you know his team is uh, critical in support in that process as well so yeah absolutely we would do that and, and i think going forward as well yeah. um, from, from mark's team audit internal audit that it will make internal audits job easier if the system in place is uh very specific yeah um, chair just one other thing as well it's it, it's not enough for us to just report something that's either underspent or overspent there has to be an action that goes with that yes yeah so, well, I, I think going forward if the report is very concise and so that we can see precisely where things are, are going well or not yeah. uh, and the action can be taken yeah of course yeah. rather than later of course yeah yeah that's a very good report, Keith. Thanks very much indeed. Very comprehensive, and I'm sure everybody listening, um, you know, on the uh, on the committee, 
will be happy to have, have heard that. Is there anybody that wants to make a comment on what Keith has said so far and the sort of reporting that we'll have on procurement going forward? Uh, is that no? Oh. Any hands up? Thanks for finding the time. Good day, uh, Keith. It's lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else want to make a comment? No? Okay. Thanks very much for that, Keith. Look forward to the um, to the next report. Um, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so on that one, then, the, the mem members of the committee are invited to comment and note the procurement update. And can I thank Keith on behalf of everybody for giving such a comprehensive report. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Um, so now it's um, agenda item nine, regulation of investigatory powers, and I'll invite Colin Hughes, senior solicitor, to present his report and invite members um, to make or to ask questions and, and comment afterwards. Thanks, Colin. Is Colin here? Oh, no. Is it is it going to be Colin or is it going to be? Um... It, it will be me, Chair, on the basis that uh, Sorry, Chair. Yes. Colin isn't here for some yeah. reason, but that's fine. Uh, I'll try and, try and keep this short, Chair. Uh, this is uh, an update for you on the regulation of investigatory powers that the Council holds. Um, for those not familiar, the world has changed a, a great deal uh, from when this was first brought in. There used to be no specific regulation, uh, and then increasingly that regulation uh, has got to, to a greater and greater extent and more and more uh, complex. Uh, we are inspected every few years. Uh, we were luck lucky enough last time to be inspected uh, by a senior police officer. Uh, in the past, those inspections I've been involved with uh, have included uh, uh, retired Lord Justices of Appeal um, and someone from military intelligence, which was a, a very <clears throat> interesting experience. Um, uh, Mr. Wright was extremely helpful uh, and gave us uh, gave us a, a fairly clean bill of health uh, and a couple of pointers. So I just wanted to, to assure you that uh, we've absolutely picked up on those, which was uh, to widen uh, our training and briefing beyond the immediate uh, officers who are involved in these processes to include children's services and people like that, uh, which, which we've done. Uh, and our annual training event took place in July. Uh, and the other was to tighten up on some of our aspects around um, uh, looking at social media uh, and we now give assurance that we uh, only, only look at uh, open sources uh, and will achieve uh, authorization if we go any further than that. Uh, as I say, it has now become more complex and to obtain authorization now we require uh, approval of a magistrate. Uh, we've twice gone to court uh, this year to get that. Uh, once in respect of test purchases, so human intelligence source uh, where we use miners to go into uh, premises uh, uh, suspected of selling to underage uh, people uh, and uh, the evidence from that uh, is going forward to uh, gone through enforcement uh, and due for prosecution uh, and the other is, is effectively fly tipping uh, where we get in order to, to put a camera in a place where we believe there's regular fly tipping uh, and again um, our, we believe we have enough evidence from that to move forward to a prosecution uh, and I'm quite happy to bring a report later in the year uh, once those prosecutions have gone through and let you know how it all went. Chair. Thanks Phil. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments to make in regard to regulation of investigatory powers? Oh David Burgess Joyce your hand is up David. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Th thank you, Phil. Um, I'll lay my cards on the table. I, I, this may come as a surprise to people, but uh, given my background, I, I'm extremely uncomfortable about uh, non-law law enforcement and security services using these powers, uh, for being honest. But I think my question is, and, and, and in the time distant past, and you may remember this, Phil, better than me, there was a, an authority down in Dorset, which I think it was, who were actually use, using ripper powers to identify whether a family lived in a catchment area for a school. Now, uh, quite an appalling situation, not certainly not what ripper should be used for, in my opinion. But I'm conscious about the two that you mentioned uh, in your report, but do you actually get an awful lot more 
or approaches from heads of departments, etc., in the council that you knock back and and what kind of numbers are we looking at? I don't want names in Hackville, but I'd be interested to know, do you get an awful lot of applications or is it fairly, fairly low level? Thank you, Phil. It, it's, uh, thank you, through, through you, Chair. It, it's fairly low level because the, because this has become more and more of a refined process uh, and each directorate has their authorised officers at that level and they meet quarterly to discuss all of these issues. Uh, then there's uh, now, I believe, a very high level of self-censorship. So it no longer gets that close to us. And if it does, it's something that's really on the margins. Uh, and uh, Colin has become something of an expert in this area of law. So there's always a, a, a good discussion over whether or not it's, uh, it's necessary. Uh, and you're right, in the past, the council's used... Uh, camera, cameras and uh, human intelligence sources for all sorts of uh, purposes where uh, specifically uh, unusually where the council was looking to prosecute uh, and of course the council in that case would have considered that fraud uh, and indeed people have been prosecuted for fraud um, for uh, lying about their children in the catchment area so that council took it seriously um, but I don't believe in this day and age we would get, uh, well, A, we, I don't believe we would apply for four, and B, uh, I certainly don't think we will get authorisation for magistrates for that. Thanks, David. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Any comments? No? Right. The recommendation is um, that the committee note the use made by the Council of Covert Surveillance since January 2020. Um, that's the end of the meeting tonight. We've gone through the whole of the nine item agenda. Um, could members note that there's another audit and risk meeting um, at six o'clock on Monday, next Monday, the 23rd of November? And with that, it just leaves me to say thank you, thank you for everybody attending tonight. Oh, Mark, Mark's got a question. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Chair. It was just a very brief item uh, in relation to the training that we were hoping to have, to have provided last week to you all as members of this committee. Uh, you'll no doubt be aware that the trainer that was coming in from SIPA uh, fell ill at the last moment kind of thing i have been talking her, to her today she has made a recovery and, and we're looking to, to try and get something on sooner rather than later i'm very mindful of the fact that that uh, we, we do have some new members sitting on this committee and uh this is important an, an important committee uh i think you need the the the, the skills and, and the sort of you know the the, the development training like uh, to, to to help you in your endeavors so uh i'll be liaising with you all directly with regards to sort of calendar dates i appreciate it's very difficult to sort of find some time like uh, but but i do think it's important and i will be pushing ahead with that so it was just to alert you to that really wow. and then the other thing if if you indulge me just for two seconds yeah. uh we're in the middle of a uh, or we just embarked upon a, uh, a week of counter fraud campaign to coincide with the International Fraud Awareness uh, Week. Um, there is an increased risk of fraud out there on, on, on the back of uh, the, the, the pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, this kind of fraudulent behaviour is targeted not just at, at organisations, but at individuals, members of the public, public kind of your local constituents, as well as local business. Anything that you can do to help promote and support that campaign would, would be really gratefully received. I have sent you all an email uh, with some links in there. Like, uh, um, I